Uh, so to start, welcome everyone uh, to Nature in the City, the Nature Scavenger Hunt and the Two Rivers Festival, which celebrates and appreciates the speed in Aramasa rivers here in Guelph. Um, a note that we are recording this event, so if you don't want to be on camera, please make sure that you keep your video off during the, the entirety of the event. My name is Heather and I am a steering committee member with the Two Rivers Festival. Uh, first and foremost, uh, a huge thank you to Nature Guelph and Denise for uh, getting this event together and being so flexible in moving to a digital platform. Of course, the, uh, the current pandemic kind of struck right before uh, the festival was a go. So it was a really quick pivot um, and all of our community groups were incredibly gracious in, in being incredibly flexible, moving this to uh, an entirely online platform. Uh, thanks to Anne for attending. Um, and thanks to everyone who watches on YouTube afterwards. It's a beautiful day and um, I think this is going to be a fantastic event and really valuable um, kind of keeping the kids and adults alike um, entertained when we go outside and, and keeping our eyes open. Um, so uh, every year the Two Rivers Festival is organized and run by volunteers and involves many community organizations including Nature Guelph, um, and they are truly the backbone of this festival. Uh, we couldn't do it without them because they are really the ones who are hosting and putting off these events. Um, and that's how we, we have such a, a huge breadth of, of amazing events lined up throughout May and June. Uh, we also uh, want to acknowledge and, and encourage you to support all of our uh, festival um, advertisers as well as our supporters or so event sponsor this year is the Guelph Outdoor School. Um, so they really are the, the generous people who make this festival possible from year to year. Uh, you can see all of our advertisers on our website um, and in our booklet. So we encourage you to take a look. Uh, we have lots of great events lined up for the remainder of June. So uh, again, check out our website and uh, see if there's anything else that uh, kind of sparks your fancy. Uh, and I encourage you to RSVP for those because um, they're all going to be recorded as well. Uh, and those recordings will be sent out. And of course, this is uh, this festival is a project of the Wellington Water Watchers, and it is our sincerest hope um, that you fall further in love with our rivers and uh, continue to support and protect them. Uh, just a quick piece of housekeeping, um, mute when you're not speaking. I think everyone is muted right now, so uh, that's fantastic. It's on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, the Q&A with Denise at the end. Um, if you have any questions, pop them into the chat bar and we'll make sure that those get addressed. Um, and of course, if you're having spotty internet connection, which is often the plague of Zoom calls, uh, suggest to you turning your video off. I'm going to be turning my, my video off once um, I finish speaking. Um, and that should help things go a little bit more smoothly. Uh, so, uh, Denise Fell is with uh, Nature Guelph. She uh, manages the social media and publicity. She's also a wildlife biologist and environmental assessment practitioner. Uh, so we are in safe and knowledgeable hands uh, with Denise here today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to her um, to help us uh, better explore nature and have a, a really wonderful scavenger hunt. Over to you, Denise. Thank you very much, Heather, and thanks so much to Two Rivers for inviting us to participate in your events and for um, giving us the impetus to actually create these virtual events. Um, I think it was your encouragement uh, that really helped us to uh, go into this new realm for us of, of, of virtual programming we've never done before, and it's been very successful. Um, we appreciate you hosting the Zoom calls for us. And uh, I think we've now had five different virtual events for the Two Rivers Festival. Um, this is the last one. And uh, we really appreciate the support of uh, everybody uh, watching and participating in these uh, presentations. So yes, our last uh, Two Rivers Festival event is an online nature scavenger hunt. And uh, it's actually also the last in our uh, kind of co-hosted events that are for with our Nature in the City series of programs that we do every year, roughly in the springtime, um, as a way to get people who are new to the area, new to nature, involved in learning how to find nature and enjoy it on their own time. Um, and these events are usually conducted, well, in person, obviously, as a series of of 
talks and then walks. So they're themed, there might be a bird talk at the library and then the next day a bird hike. So of course with COVID, we're not able to do them in person. And so instead we have tried to move these to a digital platform. The scavenger hunt is usually hosted in a lovely natural area where we can go out and all the participants are asked to find certain items on their list and, and then share what they found. Um, of course not collect them, but find them. And uh, so when I was trying to think of how we could do this virtually, um, it occurred to me that we could find these items online. So I made a listing of items that we could find in nature right now, uh, and we're gonna do them, the hunt online. So a bit about Nature Guelph. Um, we are a, a club in Guelph that's been around for over 50 years now, formerly called the Guelph Field Naturalists. And uh, we meet every month uh, on the second Thursday of the month at the Arboretum Centre when we're able to meet in person and we host a variety of walks and talks and, and events uh, either locally or further afar some, a field sometimes with carpooling options. Um, and our mandate really is to connect people with nature and to inspire them to celebrate and protect it and of course to do our part as well to celebrate and protect it. We do this through education and action and as part of education, we have, like I said, a speaker series. We have a lot of outdoor pro programs. We also uh, have our youth programs and uh, we have community outreach as well. As part of action, we do do conservation projects. We help to fundraise to purchase properties. Uh, Rare has been um, purchasing properties. We've been fundraising to support them. We do other projects as well. I think I'll be talking about one of them a bit later, actually. Um, we also conduct citizen science. So we'll go out and uh, do bio blitzes or uh, different surveys of frogs or birds. And we'll also get our members to come out and do it with us and as well as advocacy. So when there are issues in the community or further out in all of Ontario, we will write letters to council or to the government um, trying to support um, conservation initiatives. All of our programming is free, unless of course there's some kind of, a, of an admittance fee to a natural area that we're visiting. Uh, but we always welcome people to become members and your membership fees go towards supporting our programming. So our speaker series, uh, our outdoor programs, our youth programs, and we're very proud of our Young Naturalists and our Eco Leaders program, which is new for this year. Uh, the Young Naturalists get together a couple times a month at the Guelph Lake Nature Center, of course, with COVID not right now. And our Eco Leaders uh, were a group of teens getting together at the Arboretum and getting really involved in the community and, and, and doing their own projects. Uh, the outreach that we do includes Nature in the City, of course, and um, various other projects. And of course, just administering uh, the group and being able to pay to, to rent facilities for our meetings. Uh, there's convenient ways to purchase a membership. You can go online to our website. You can give it in person. When we do have our monthly meetings starting up, we hope they'll start up in the fall, but it's hard to say. Um, and uh, any members that per membership purchase now will be valid for the entire uh, next fiscal year from 2020 uh, September until the following September in 2021. All right, so without further ado, let's actually get to the nature scavenger hunt. So I don't know um, if anybody watching actually uh, tried to find the items online that I sent out ahead of time. But the very first item that we we're going to try and find, and I asked everybody if they could, to go ahead and look online and find the items so that when we had the presentation, you could let me know what you found and where you found it. So the first item was a photograph of a butterfly species that's native to Guelph. Did anybody happen to uh, go around online and try and find one? And if so, what did you find and where? You can go ahead and unmute if you want to give your answer. Okay, I'll take that as a no. So I'll show you what I found and let's hope this, this works. All right, so I was poking around the internet and uh, we love Rare uh, in Cambridge because they do so much to protect the environment and they've been purchasing properties along the Aramosa River. Um, and I was poking around their website and I found uh, under the research tab, this beautiful picture of a butterfly. And if I go into here, I'll see it. It's actually a Compton tortoiseshell, uh, a gorgeous butterfly native to the area. It overwinters as an adult. And it's actually one of the very first butterflies to emerge in the spring around Guelph. Um, so there it is, a lovely butterfly. 
All right, so that's that. Okay, the next item we were to find was a sound clip of the melodic flute-like song of the wood thrush. Oh, I just love hearing these birds call. It reminds me of my childhood and being in a deep, dark, warm, uh, really just beautiful forest. So did anybody happen to poke around and try and find the song of a wood thrush? Or are you familiar with the song of a wood thrush? Okay. If you, again, if you want to talk about it at all, I feel free to unmute and just go ahead, okay? All right, so uh, the wood thrush is um, in the thrush family. Uh, so are American robins. They look quite similar, but these guys live in the forest and they actually require tracks of fairly undisturbed, really good quality forest. So they're not very common around here because our forests in the Guelph area are quite small and they're more like a woodlot. Uh, if you do hear a wood thrush, you know you're in a, a fairly large, good quality forest. It's a good indicator of that. So they're certainly declining. Uh, they're not nearly as common as they used to be because these forests are not as common around here as they used to be. So if I go back to here, I hope this works. Um, I was poking around the internet and found the Cornell Lab, which is an amazing website to find information about birds, has uh, in their library um, some calls of the wood thrush. So I'm going to try to play this for you. Um, and just if you want, close your eyes and imagine you're just sitting in a, in a, a beautiful lush forest. We're not getting the sound, sadly. Oh, I wonder how we can get the sound. Huh. So That's interesting. I apologize. You, no, not a problem. When you go to share your screen, there should be an option somewhere to share computer sound. Maybe under advanced sharing options. You get it? Yep. Okay. Tell me if it works. Beautiful. Okay. They're so beautiful, aren't they? All right. So there is the beautiful wood thrush. Gorgeous call. This one's quite comfortable. He's got one leg tucked up against his body. All right. So you can poke around here and learn more about the wood thrush as well. There are other songs as well that you can see uh, and listen to. Um, but that's the main call that uh, I love to hear in the forest. Okay. So the next item I was asking people to find was a photograph of a native woodland wildflower that's flowering in spring. And if you were participating in one of our Two Rivers um, and Nature in the City presentations a few weeks ago, uh, Judy uh, from Nature Guelph would have shown you an amazing slideshow. It's on Mother's Day, I believe, as a Mother's Day walk, um, virtual walk. Uh, of gorgeous woodland wildflowers that are flowering around Starkey Hill. So I was thinking that we could uh, sh talk about uh, what woodland wildflowers everyone likes to see and what you have seen. And if you did find any uh, recently, either photographs online or when you're walking around, I'd love for you to share it with me. So feel free to unmute and let me know your favorite wildflower or one that you've seen recently. I saw bloodroot, really liked that. I love bloodroot. Very yeah. beautiful. One of the very first ones to flower in my yard, in my garden. Yes. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. The flowers don't last too long. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I now have three trilliums growing in my own backyard. Started with one, but they've grown to three. Um, beautiful. Yes. Uh, lots of violets. Trout lily. Mm hmm Maybe that's a beautiful it. yellow flower. Well, that's great. Okay, well, if you want, I can show you what I found. Please. Now, all right, so let's go. So, oh, <laughs> I had bloodroot. <laughs> so there you go. For those of you who don't know what bloodroot is, I actually went to the Ontario Wildflowers website, which is really great because it, uh, it, it has pretty much every wildflower you can come across in Ontario on this website. 
and it gives you a lot of good information about the about the plants, what family they're in. You can find similar species, um, some diagnostic things, and then pictures of them. So it's really great. So here we are. Here's some pictures of bloodroot here in the forest floor popping up. Um, some gorgeous pictures of it. Very pretty flower. Quite common in the in the in the woodlands around Guelph, which is nice. So there it is, just starting to emerge from the ground. And here we are when it's just for the flowers open. And the leaves just stay for, around for quite a long time in the summertime. They don't tend to die back, which is nice. And there's the, the really cute little seed pod right there. And this is why the plant is called bloodroot. The, blood, the roots have a, a bright red um, uh, juice, juice. I mean, juice isn't probably the right term, but inside of them. So there, you could use it to uh, as a natural dye if you wanted to, as a red dye. So. And uh, it's found pretty much throughout all of Ontario. So that is bloodroot. Okay, we'll go on to the next item. Oh yeah, so I was thinking that it'd be neat to find a live stream video feed of a nest cam of a bird species that you might be able to find around Guelph if you looked hard enough. I don't care if the nest cam is like in the Guelph area, but I thought it'd be kind of fun. And on the Nature Guelph Facebook page, I often try to share uh, links to different nest cam video feeds. Um, that, uh, that I think our members might like to watch, especially I was doing that a lot this spring because we're stuck inside. And so it was nice to kind of get to watch these birds um, be a fly on the wall and watch them as they're raising their babies. Did anybody happen to find uh, this or, or are you aware of any nest cams? A friend of mine actually had a nest cam of a mallard that was nesting right outside of her back door. Um, they're not there anymore because the, the eggs hatched, uh, but she was nesting in a planter of chives. Um, so she set up her own nest cam for, uh, for a little while. Okay, so that, that is so cool. And if she ever wanted to live stream and share the link with Nature Guelph, <laughs> I'd be happy. That is really cool. Mallards are interesting because people come across their nests and I've actually seen them nesting downtown Guelph in the, on the, in the courtyard of a church right downtown. Um, people are like, what are they doing so far from water? But it's really common for mallards to nest pretty far from water. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I can certainly share you one of the ones that I was looking at. Um, typically, I like to watch the Bellwood Lake Osprey nest cam every year. Unfortunately, this year, the Grand River Conservation Authority decided, this is before COVID, that they would not have it up and running this year. It's been a lot of time and energy for them to maintain that camera. And so sadly, they decided not to maintain it this year. Um, so then I thought I would try to find another osprey nest cam and I found one uh, in Colorado and uh, typically speaking, generally speaking, it's got a really nice view of these guys. So if I do this, here he is right now live on the nest. Beautiful view. Wow. So it's interesting too how they bring in uh, debris uh, that's not natural materials to their nest. So you can see the netting in here. Uh, sadly, the um, the ospreys at Guelph Lake have had their young get tangled up in fishing line that they brought up to the net and they the nest and they actually had to have people go up last year and 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 pull the net the, the fishing line down and untangle the young from it because that actually one was dangling upside down off the nest. Um, but they found it really quickly that because people were watching the nest cam and uh, reported it to GRCA, so very quickly they were able to get that bird untangled. He had to go to a rehab center for a, a couple of weeks just to make sure his leg healed up, but then he was able to be brought back to the nest. So there we go, yeah. Do you know if the osprey has young there right now? Oh yeah, they're eggs right now, actually, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think I was looking at a couple days ago and there, was, there were eggs that were visible. So I don't know if they'll ever put that Bellwood Lake nest cam back in service, but that was pretty neat. I've also seen really neat raven nest cams. There was one in, um, gosh, where was it? Iceland, I think it might have been. Really neat, like on the roof of a, of a hardware store. Um, really neat nest cam. I think they might have fledged those young by now, though, so that one might not be in operation anymore. Okay, the next item I thought we'd try and find was an example of uh, 
effective window markers that are put on windows to prevent bird collisions with them um, for residential situations. So um, you might have, have heard of or had the experience, sadly, of a bird colliding with your window. Uh, typically, that's because the reflections of the background uh, of, of the environment around them make them think that they can just keep flying right through it, and they don't realize that it, there's a barrier there, and they collide with it. Uh, so one of the ways to stop that um, is to put markers on the outside of the window that break up that reflection so that the birds know it's not just more of the outside. Um, and to be effective, they have to be put on a certain way uh, so that they actually are close enough together and are uh, wide enough in a way that they actually are well seen by the birds. And of course, I said bonus points if it's on your own window at home. Uh, has anybody ever seen any examples or have your own examples of window markers on the outside of windows in a home? I know about that uh, film you can get to apply on the windows that has dots on it. Yes. The, the dots have to be quite close together. That's right. They do indeed. In fact, BirdSafe, which is the new website of uh, the Fatal Light Awareness Program group, FLAP, uh, which goes around uh, are famous for going around downtown Toronto during migration to collect uh, migratory songbirds that have succumbed to getting stuck in the city, especially with lighting on at night in the high rises and they get confused and they, they can't find their way out and they fall to the ground exhausted or they hit windows. Uh, they have this amazing website, birdsafe.ca, and they have so much information here about residential and commercial uh, ways to keep birds from colliding with windows. And under the residential tab, they do talk a bit about um, the problems and solutions, um, including visual markers on windows. They talk here a bit about uh, the requirements for spacing, uh, where they have to be applied, the size and the coverage of the entire glass surface. Um, and it, you can go into their guidelines and get more information about them, but you'll see here they talk a bit about the visual guide. Here's some dots, these are larger dots. Uh, there's some do-it-yourself options, so you can actually apply uh, waterproof white or other colored marker to the outside and create patterns. Anyways, lots of good information here for you to find out how to do it yourself or what to purchase to use, um, but it does have to be applied a certain way to be effective. And um, I have also an example of the, those dots you were talking about. I know I've purchased those dots before, I think at Walbirds Unlimited, they're on a tape. And uh, so there's a long tape with the dots on it and you just apply it to your window and pull the tape off and you have the dots spaced exactly where you need them, two inches apart. I think it's two or is it four? Some of the smaller birds need them to be closer together, two inches, and some of the larger birds, four inches is fine. Um, okay, so I wanna show you an example of uh, what Nature Guelph did um, a few years ago where we partnered with uh, different people, including the Arboretum, and we had those feather-friendly dots applied to the Arboretum Center windows because there were birds colliding with the Arboretum Center. So if you're familiar with the Arboretum Center in Guelph, you'll see that some of the windows that are facing the entrance, which is where there's a pond, have these white dots on them right here. So. This is an example, just a, a post that we did on, on Facebook or that the Arboretum did, uh, talking about how they were, when they were installed. Okay, so yeah, that's, a, that's an example of what those dots look like. And when you're inside looking out, you really don't see them. It's quite amazing, actually. They just disappear. So really effective. All right, so the next item that we were going to find was, oh yeah, I couldn't resist. I thought we'd try and find some photos of adorable mammal babies, of mammals that you could see around Guelph in the springtime. I don't know if you found any photos or if you wanna share any stories of, of adorable mammal babies you've seen recently this spring. I haven't seen them myself because I'm not living at my own house right now. I'm living somewhere else, but my next door neighbors told me that there are some adorable bunny babies in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> the little girls love them. <laughs> My garden, not so much. Yeah. As well, um, definitely. Uh, I thought I would share a picture of a bunny from my yard. This is a little baby bunny from my yard. <laughs> uh, there was about six or seven of them uh, around that I see every once in a while. And so that's one of them right there. Very, very cute. But because we were trying to find things online, okay, I'm trying to make this, okay, it 
it's getting hard to do this. Okay, here we go. Uh, I thought I would find some adorable pictures of fox babies, fox kits, because I just love them. They're so cute. So, oh my gosh, all right, so cute. <laughs> um, they're so adorable. And uh, yeah. Around this time last year, I was up next to uh, the U of G campus where the the horse pasture is, and in the long grass, there is a bunch of uh, red oh. fox kits. Very sweet. I keep hearing, and I have actually seen fox around that area too, not kits, unfortunately. I keep hearing that because less people have been around, that people have been seeing a lot more fox kits around, especially in Toronto. Um, so this is a some cute videos too that you can find you know so here's some fox kids nursing and playing around their mum in Algonquin Park so cute and then I had another one here uh of fox kits in Brighton Ontario I thought it was pretty darn cute Right around somebody's house. I'm not sure what the caution tape is there for, if it's because the kits are around there a lot. Anyway, they're pretty cute. So yeah, lots of neat places to find pictures online or videos online. Okay. So the next thing we were looking for was a sound clip of a frog call of a frog species native to the area. So you can even talk about uh, the frogs you've been hearing if you want this spring. I miss hearing the frogs in the spring because I moved into Guelph not that long ago from Hillsburg, where I would hear the spring peepers behind mm. my house. Um, although in more recent years, they weren't as deafening as they had been in the past. I love that sound. I do like the spring peepers too. They can get very, very loud. Yes. Um, you can actually get hearing damage if you're oh, in yeah. amongst them for too long without ear, yeah. ear protection. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm quite fond of the call of the Western uh, chorus frog, a species at risk in Ontario, uh, definitely occurs around the Guelph area. Uh, the spring when driving along some of the roadsides, I was definitely hearing them here and there along the roadsides. Um, in ponds, uh, just little little vegetated uh, wooded, wooded ponds. And uh, they have a really neat call that sounds like drawing your finger along the teeth of a comb. So let's see if this works. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite unusual. Um, and then, uh, whoops, oh dear, I just pressed something now and now I don't know what I'm doing, sorry. <laughs> uh, are you still there? Oh dear, okay. Did you stop sharing your screen? Oh dear, um, I didn't mean to. <laughs> if the green press... share screen button is there, you should just be able to keep, click it and it'll go back. There you go. There you go. Okay, and am I still sharing? Yes, I am. Okay, sorry about that. I'm trying to click along the top of my screen, but I keep clicking the menu for Zoom. It's kind of in the way. Okay, so can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay, so there's a, a, a lot of places to find uh, videos of frog calls or sounds of frog calls. This is a neat video because in a minute it goes through pretty much all the frogs of Ontario. They're not all found in the Guelph area, but a lot of them are. There's a bullfrog. Like jug a rum, jug a rum. Cricket frogs sound like two rocks being tapped together. They're not really found here. The trill of the American toad we definitely hear around Guelph. We do not have Fowler's toad. They're in the very south at Point Keeley. We don't really have a frog. They're neat. Another chorus frog. The green frog is neat because it's like a rubber band being snapped, like gunk and we do have them around here. Pickerel frogs are like a snore, a long snore, or a sort of a low roar. Um, not found as much around here, but they definitely are in the area. There's your spring peeper. Oh, 
northern leopard frog. <laughs> kind of funny. And red frogs are hilarious because you hear them around Guelph for sure, and they sound like somebody kind of chuckling and laughing. I just find them really fun. They're like a duck quacking. Here's the western chorus frog that we have around here again. And of course the gray tree frog, which we also definitely have around here. So, all right. And now I'm having trouble with my, there we go. Okay, do you see the, uh, the slideshow again? Yes. Okay, good. So the next was a photo of an invasive non-native plant species that you commonly find in the Guelph area. You probably know which one I'm gonna come up with. Any suggestions? Oh, garlic, garlic mustard. mustard. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> that might be what I used. <laughs> so if you go to CanPlant, it's a really great database um, that has uh, over 5,000 plants found across Canada. And of course, one of the plants that I found there was garlic mustard. Um, there's some pictures here of garlic mustard to show you the flowers and uh, the leaves. Uh, unfortunately, there's the basil leaves, very, very common all around Guelph. Um, it invades native woodlands and it excludes native species. It also releases a chemical that prevents other species from growing. So it's very good at preventing competition, which is not good for our native plants. It's more information is here about Is there a best the time to go out and pull that? Or can you go through the season? Control of the garlic mustard is tricky because the seeds can be all throughout the soil and uh, remain viable for many, many, many years. And if you pull the plant, you disturb the soil, you expose the seed bank and more will grow. It's really good if you can keep it from ever going to seed and getting it, pulling it before then. If there's yes. a seed bank, then it becomes trickier as to what the best method is because it's just gonna keep growing from that seed bank. So if you can stick around for a long time and keep pulling it, that's fine, but you're always disturbing the soil and allowing it to come back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, there's definitely a lot of information online about how to control it. Yes. Um, what do the seed pods look like? Like the top picture you've got there, the yeah. large picture, are those guess, long bits? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, yeah. No, those are, hmm. They do look like a bit like long like that. That's not a good picture. Uh, okay. You'd find there'll be a lot of good pictures online. I'm sure there will be. Yeah. 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 All right, okay. The next, oh, the next item. Oh yeah, I thought we'd try and find a video of a snapping turtle. And I thought bonus points if it actually is a video of, of someone showing you how to, te to, to take him across the road. <laughs> so of course this time of year and in the fall as well, uh, turtles were on the move. They're moving to nesting areas. They're, they're moving to new food, feed, uh, food areas. They need to be able to move from here to there. And unfortunately roads are in the way. Uh, there are some roads where people will actually will either close the road off in the springtime, uh, but but usually uh, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately, their, their turtles are attracted to the roadsides because the gravel shoulders are really good nesting substrate, and so they want to get up there to nest as well, which is really dangerous. Um, and uh, yeah, turtles need, they need to cross the road, and, and in some places where there's a lot of turtle mortality, they'll actually put fencing up and then create underpasses or overpasses for the turtles to cross the road. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've ever seen a turtle crossing the road and had to try to help one. Oops. There we go. But I found this great video on how to help a turtle cross the road. So let's give it a listen. Wow, you wouldn't want to cross him. <laughs> It's really important when you do help a turtle cross the road that you are safe, 
okay? Do not do it if you have risk of being hit by a car, okay? Um, and it's also really important that you move it in the same direction it was traveling because it's trying to cross the road for a reason. And if you don't let it cross the road, it will just do it again. All right. The next item was a photo of a fungus or a mushroom that you can find in the Guelph area. Um, any thoughts on what mushrooms are, fun of course, a mushroom being the fruiting body of a, of a fungus um, that you've seen in the Guelph area? I walk along Woolwich a lot and there's a bunch of old tree stumps that have been cut down and there's just always mm. a huge amount of mushrooms in the spring and the fall that are around. I have no idea what they are, but there's just loads of them. Are they like the shelf fungus, the long, thin ones that sort of stick out like a shelf? No, they like emerge oh, okay. from the ground, Oh, uh, which is really nice, yeah, really neat. Different ones in the fall and the spring, but I think mm -hmm. in the, the spring, they're kind of like a, a really dark brown or a blackish color. Cool. Yeah. Well, um, I found a neat site here called Urban Mushrooms. Uh, what mushroom is growing in my yard? So this is cool because it's mushrooms that you might find in your yard. Um, and when I was looking through here, uh, I found a mushroom in here that I commonly find in my yard. It's not the puffball, unfortunately. Puffballs are, are kind of neat to have. And uh, I, if you have one in your yard, you can actually eat one as I understand it. But I don't think I'd ever want to eat a mushroom I found because I'd be worried <laughs> that I would get one that's poisonous. <laughs> but um, I thought it was neat that they had a mushroom here that I see all the time. And okay, I'm gonna keep scrolling down until I find it. This is so common. Uh, the Japanese parasol, uh, it's actually not from Japan, it, it is native. But what's interesting is that, I don't know if you, I've seen these all the time in parks, in grass, they are really, really common and they're very, very fragile. Uh, like they can be broken really quickly. Um, and I actually have one, have one growing in my yard two days ago in the backyard. Uh, so these are really, really common. Um, so I thought it was kind of neat to find it. I didn't know the name of it. So now I know what it is. Uh, Coprinus plicatilis. So yeah, that was a neat one. Okay, next item. A species of lichen that's only found in the University of Guelph Arboretum. Any thoughts? Well, this is super cool. So a couple of years ago, I think it was, researchers were looking around the Arboretum at the University of Guelph and they discovered a brand new species of lichen not known to science before now and it only grows there so far. It's not been found anywhere else. So I thought that was really, really cool. Guelph has its own lichen. Um, I don't know how you say it. I should have probably looked into how to say it. Anybody have any thoughts on this? Uh, Canoth Canothica selvae? Canothica? I don't think it's ch, but I'm not sure. Canothica? Canothica? It could be kino. Kino, thank you. That would be it. So I thought this was really, really cool. And if you wanted to learn more about this, there's certainly information here about it. Um, here it is on a piece of bark. There's an up. So, uh, oh, that's a different picture. Okay, anyway, so there's a little video here. I don't know that I'll show it all. But, um... I'm Troy McMullen. Uh, I work at the Canadian Museum of Nature, uh, and we're looking at a stubble lichen. So this is one that uh, we're describing, uh, me and some colleagues. Um, it's called Kinathika selvae, uh, and it's named after Steve Selva, who's, a, uh, who's worked on this group of lichens his entire career. What makes it unique, uh, first of all, is the uh, the algae, so the body of the lichen actually lives in the wood that you see here, um, and it's immersed, it's in the wood. So that's this first main character, is that the full body of the lichen is inside the wood. And then the type of algae it's associated with is our next identifying feature. And then the fruiting bodies, which sticking up here, uh, they form a cup at the top. And inside that cup, that mound that's sticking out of the top is full of spores. And what's really distinctive about this species is this orange brown pruna is what it's called. It's a crystallization of the chemical inside. And the color, the shape, the location is very unique with this species. So this species was discovered during an inventory of the Arboretum at the University of Guelph. It was a study I'd been working on for several years and many people came out to help me. And one of them was a student, his name was Jose Malolas, and he was the first one to bring it out and we couldn't figure out what it was and that led us down the road of 
looking for more of it and looking at new places. And uh, it is only known from that arboretum. Uh, so it's really fascinating that um, we don't have to go to distant lands, we don't have to go to deep ocean vents to find new species. There's still lots of undiscovered biodiversity in our backyards. Uh, and this is a great example of that. So I thought that was really cool and interesting that uh, there are still new species to be discovered close to home right here in Guelph. Um, really cool, really neat. Lichen are fascinating too, um, and amazing uh, sources of nutrients for caribou, which are also of course an endangered species um, in Canada. Um, but lichen are extremely important and very slow growing. So uh, you can't just recreate lichen habitat quickly. All right. So those are the items that I thought we'd find online. I just had a couple of bonus items in the list. Um, and the first one was anything you can see outside of your window, any nature at all you can see outside your window. So uh, for those who are on the call right now, what have you seen outside your window today or even you know, in recent times or right now? What do you see? Cedar trees. <laughs> Perfect. That's nature. Yes. My window faces another building, but often at the very top of the building, I see birds. Birds are perching on top all the time. Nice. All right. Well, when I look at... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I go ahead. Say, I can see a beautiful red maple tree. Oh, very nice. Huge, yeah. I bet you, and I bet there were pro probably quite a few birds in there, especially in the spring when it was flowering. Yes, and there were definitely. pollinators all in the flowers, and the birds were feeding on the pollinators. Oh yeah, lots of yeah. lots of songs, yeah. lots of songs. Beautiful. Well, when I look at my window right now, I see my bird feeding area. I'm so lucky that I can look out my window, and I have my bird feeding station right out there. Um, and it's been really busy this spring. Um, Another year where I've had Orioles coming to the feeder. I had a few more last year, but uh, that was pretty exciting. Um, males and females were coming. Um, and my bird feeders are actually all hanging pretty much from an old plum tree that's decaying. Uh, and it actually has all holes inside of it. And the squirrels love to crawl all over it, but my bird feeders are fairly squirrel proof. So they have to feed on the ground uh, to get the seeds that have fallen to the ground. But I do have uh, certainly gray squirrels. Uh, I had, I've had rose-breasted grosbeaks again this year at my feeders. Um, they've moved on now. Um, and of course, I get a whole bunch of common birds at my feeder, you know, like uh, I'll get nut hatches and I'll get woodpeckers, but I'll also get starlings and grackles and house sparrows. And I had a white throated, a white crowned sparrow for a while this spring when it was moving on and, and migrating. Um, and uh, I, I do love to watch um, the chipmunks. Uh, that chipmunk there in the left corner is actually in the base of that tree that all my feeders are hanging from. Um, and that red squirrel there on the right, the bottom, uh, obviously a mother, you can tell, uh, she's been, been uh, feeding her young, but uh, she also was trying to get in and get some of the jelly because the, the Oriole feeder is not, is not hanging from a, a squirrel proof uh, post. So she's able to get in there and sample the jelly at the odd time. So, yeah, I'm very fortunate. Oh, actually I didn't need to do that, I'm done with that. So the next one was, a nature item of your choice that you can find in your own yard or anywhere nearby, um, if you've gone for a walk down the street, anything of your choice that you might see uh, around your own, your own yard. We've been seeing lots of northern flickers this year. We've never really noticed them as much um, in the past, but I guess it's a little bit quieter in the park, so they've been uh, foraging on the ground quite a lot. Nice. Anybody else see any nature close to home? I saw I saw an Oriole. Hmm. I don't see them very often, and she, and she had a, or he, I guess it was a male had a beautiful song, and I made a recording of it on my phone. I don't know if this is good or not, but then I played it back, and uh, the and the the Oriole kept singing and was having a nice time. Huh. But I don't know if that's a good thing or not to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people will play a call to get a call bird to call back. Um, often just so they're doing a survey. Um, and it, I guess it depends on what that the, the bird you're looking for is doing. Is it defending a territory or is it just migrating through? Uh, for some birds, it can be very stressful for them to hear a competing uh, 
a member of their own species and it, they could spend a lot of energy and time trying to track it down and ch chase it away. And that could be detrimental if it's taking care of young. But I, I suspect at this time of year, what you did was, was probably not going to be that harmful. I mean, if you didn't do it for a long time. Yeah. No, no. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. That was it can be hard on owls if you do it a lot because then they have to leave their nest area and try and find the predator, the, the predator, sorry, the, the competitor. And uh, that can be, that can be hard on them. Okay, well, uh, I thought I'd show a picture of some of the plants growing in my backyard. I have some woodland plants and uh, I thought this was a neat to little um, arrangement here of a, a really, it's actually quite tall, that jack in the pulpit on the left. It's actually um, amazingly large. When it was coming up out of the ground, I couldn't believe the spear on it coming up. It was just, I swear it was almost an inch across, um, really large. And it opened up beautifully. And the plants that I have here that have yellow flowers uh, probably look a little bit like greater celandine, which is very common in people's yards and pops up. It's, but it's an invasive plant from Europe. This is actually a wood poppy, which is a native species that's endangered, but you can find in nurseries. So that's where I got this one. I would never dig it from the wild. Um, and it's quite lovely. It's very pretty. Um, and it actually reproduces by seed quite readily. I planted one two years ago. I now have about five plants in my yard. And it's what's interesting is that it's actually planted by ants, just like trillium seeds are. There's a delicious little packet of, of, uh, of energy attached to the seed. And the ants will pick that seed up, carry it away, feed that uh, little packet of food to their the the larvae, and then they'll plant the seed when they're doing that. So it's kind of neat. And I really, I, I've got a lot of joy this spring, for, I have to say, from my woodland plants. Um, I'm not normally home very much, so I don't normally get to really enjoy them. You know, you get home from work and then it's getting dark and you get dinner ready and, you, you know, and on the weekend you're busy doing chores. So working from home has been absolutely a joy just because I've been able to go out every day and watch my plants as they grow and change. Trying to post pictures when I can. Uh, Nature Guelph actually also moderates a, a community forum called the Nature Guelph Community Forum on Facebook, where we encourage people just to talk about the nature they see in Guelph and area. Share pictures, share stories, ask questions. Um, so it's been really nice seeing people posting information about what they've been finding this year on that. And I believe that's it that I have for you. So I think we have, yeah, we have enough time to talk about quite to, about items that you've seen. Uh, any questions you have? I'm yours. Hi, it's Carrie. I joined the group a little bit late. I was actually out planting some uh, potatoes and some squash. I figured I might as well give that a go in the back laneway. But um, I noticed my property has a lot of yellow columbines and they just grow crazy. Um, I, I usually just end up pulling them out. Are they good for, um, I guess, butterflies and bees and stuff? Hmm. Or? I'm not sure. I mean, I would think that columbines are probably good for pollinators. The, the problem with the European and other non-native varieties which readily self-seed, and I know they even have come into my yard, is that if you're trying to grow the native Canada columbine, which is a beautiful red plant with a bit of a yellow uh, inside, um, yeah. it will readily hybridize with any non-native columbine in the area, and all the seeds that come from them will then be the non-native variety. So if you're trying to grow the native kind, which is gorgeous and I highly recommend it, um, I, would I would say don't have any of the non-native ones anywhere near you. And if you're near a natural area where wild ones are growing, I would suggest not having the non-native columbine growing as well. Okay, good. Thank you. I have seen the native ones and um, they just seem a little bit finer too, the leaf. and Yeah, they are a bit finer. Thing. That's true. The, and the flower is a little bit... Uh, not quite as large and showy, but still stunning, like a bright red color. Um, in fact, they're quite common to find in garden centers when you're looking to buy native plants. Um, and this year, the World Wildlife Fund has partnered with uh, Carolinian Canada and others to create um, uh, a, an easy way for people to find and purchase non-native, sorry, native plants. Um, they've, uh, they've got a few growers in Ontario, including St. William's Nursery who have grown native plants for this program specifically and have labeled them. And they've been selling them now at uh, Loblaws Garden Centers. And in Guelph, um, three of the Zares are actually carrying them as well. So it's nice to know that they're, they're locally sourced, they're, they're not dug from the wild, they're grown from seed, they're grown from nurseries, supporting local businesses, that kind of thing, uh, by doing that. I know it's Loblaws Corporation, but 
those those local nurseries in Ontario are the ones that are providing all those plants. And I did actually purchase two columbines from one of the Zayers in Guelph um, from that program a, a couple weeks ago. So. Very nice. And Nature Guelph also, uh, every year we do um, a seed workshop for our members and non-members uh, where we get together, plant a bunch of seeds together and talk about how to grow them. We could do that in person this year, but we did actually end up giving out seeds to people for free. And we will also be doing our annual native plant sale online this year, not in person. So uh, any day now, members will be getting an email talking about how they can place their orders and, and how they can do their curbside pickup. And then uh, a few days after the members have had a chance to do it, we'll open it up to the public. So keep an eye on our Facebook page. And uh, if you're interested, you can get the information on that. If you're a member, you will get an email about it in advance. Denise, what are some of the uh, frog hotspots? If I wanted to go and listen for some frogs, where in Guelph should I be headed? Honestly, anywhere there's water, just about, to be honest. Um, water in the spring, you're going to want to go where the, the water dries up. Uh, frogs um, have a lot of com uh, a lot of predators that want to eat their the tadpoles and the eggs, so they tend to breed in ponds that dry up that are ephemeral uh, so that there's no fish in them. Um, but I've really found that, especially a little, a, maybe a month ago when frogs were more actively calling, I could drive around the roads around Guelph and put my window down and anywhere that there was some water beside the road, I was hearing frogs call. So uh, any of the ponds to the north of the city uh, around Ignatius, there are ponds along Woodlawn Road, ponds kind of on the outskirts of the city. Uh, to be honest, you take any of the major roads out and start driving through country roads and uh, Pretty much all of those wet areas have, have frogs calling in them, to be honest. They're not hard to find. Uh, around the um, Guelph Lake Nature Center, along those country roads, there's definitely some ponds along there that I heard was hearing wood frogs, spring peeper, and chorus frog calling in. Even in the city, I live in the city and I hear toads calling and pe people have ponds in their yard. Great. Oh, of course, the Arboretum, right? I mean, I know it's hard to get in there right now because you can't park there, but if you can bike there or walk there, I mean, frogs are pretty much done calling at this point now, although you'll hear wood frogs call on and off because they hang out in the trees and they might call the odd time. Uh, and I think toads might still be calling a bit, but um, bullfrogs and greed frogs might call a bit through the summer. They're in larger ponds, but uh, the Arboretum in the spring is amazing at Wild Goose, Wild Goose Woods. Um, there's a, a really nice area there with lots of frogs. Oh, that's great. I just I just found this group on Facebook. I actually live in Georgina, which is up by um, Lake Simcoe. So I don't live in the Guelph area. I love Guelph, though. I have family in, in um, Kitchener, and I had family that did grow up in Guelph. But I hope it's okay. I can still be part of the group. Of course. There's probably a local naturalist club near you as well. I'm pretty sure there is. Okay. But the more the merrier. I mean, we all like to... Um, you know, the more members we can have, the, the better. And we love to talk to people from other nature clubs as well and uh, share information and ideas. Yeah, I, I, I joined last year the Lake Simcoe Gardeners Association. Oh. And that was, I learned a lot. We had, you know, every three months a meeting. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to do meetings or even Zoom or anything like that. So I, I feel kind of sad that, so I was happy I found this group that, uh, talk about nature and flowers and I missed the bird watching one this morning or the for beginners um, but uh, thank you that's great and the video for this morning's um, bird watching for beginners uh, session will be available probably within a couple of weeks um, so uh, keep an eye out for it because all of these uh, videos are going to be made available online for folks who aren't able to attend so keep an eye out for that one I will. Thank you. Because I really do love birds. I love watching birds. I love listening to birds. And, and so that'd be great. Thank you. Certainly something I've noticed kind of, I am also working from home now and I've been kind of taking advantage for that, of that daily walk. And I've, I've always liked the sound of birds and 
seeing birds, but now we're really starting to kind of uh, get into the realm of wondering what is that bird and just trying to identify it by sound and seeing and stopping and watching the tree to see for, to, to check for any movement. So it's kind of been a, it's been a, a horrible time, but also a benefit of, of all that time that we've been able to spend at home is that we're really, you know, we're doing the exact same walk almost every single day. So you start to keep an eye out for all of the little things. So we've, we've been kind of keeping a tally of all the new birds that we've seen and been able to identify. And certainly if you want to start learning about what you're seeing on your own, there are some great apps for your phone that you can download. iNaturalist is a great app for finding uh, what you're looking at, not just birds, but anything. Um, and also uh, for, for birds, uh, there are some apps like iBird Pro that I've been using. Um, so there's definitely like, you know, and if you wanna know what birds are in your area, eBird is a good resource to go to online to find out what birds have been seen in your area and when they were last seen. So that, that helps you kind of understand what you, you could be finding. Mm -hmm. And if it's a certain bird you thought you saw, if eBird has no records, then you probably didn't see it. Um, unless it's a rarity that's come in, which is possible, but it's a good place to you find know, I out. Think, I guess with us humans not being around and driving and going into parks and stuff, I'm sure there is a lot of change with even just not walking through the park and not stepping on species of plants and um, not cutting maybe trees that birds were in and yeah so I'm sure there's a big shift for sure. I think so and I think people are home more so they're seeing more birds too. Um, I know that people have been talking about seeing the Orioles and, and such this year and people were wondering if there's more of them and I wonder if it's just because people are home and we're actually able to enjoy the wildlife coming around our homes and, and get a walk at lunch. That's true, very true. Anyways, yeah, so, I mean, we've talked about Nature Guelph. We're certainly on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, more active on Facebook. It's a great platform to share information about what's going on in the area. I've been trying to share uh, nature happenings that are going on in the area and also information about uh, natural area openings and closures to keep people aware of what's going on that might affect them, their ability to get out and enjoy, enjoy nature. And activities to do from home as well. Wonderful. And we're just coming up on 2 p.m. So unless there's any last questions, I think we'll probably start to wrap it up. Hearing none, uh, I will okay, just... Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, and thanks for uh, those who were able to attend and those who were able to watch later. Um, I think this is one that I'll, uh, I'll keep revisiting because you shared so many fantastic links and uh, lots of really interesting tidbits um, just kind of to, to broaden uh, the way that we're exploring nature and, and all the things that we're looking for. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to Nature Guelph again for being um, such stalwart companions to the Two Rivers Festival uh, and you know hosting such wonderful events with us every single year. Uh, and I invite everyone to go to tworiversfestival.org to check out the rest of our uh, June events. There's a bunch uh, remaining and coming up. Sounds good, thank you. My pleasure, thank you for attending. Okay. Thanks everyone, thanks Denise.